It's my pleasure to introduce to you this morning our next speaker, Professor Michael Kerwin. Professor Kerwin is an Irish British Jesuit and theologian. After teaching theology at Heathrop College for 20 years, he moved to Ireland in 2017, where he is now an assistant professor in Catholic theology and director of the Loyola Institute in Trinity College, Dublin. He has been involved with Girard and mimetic theory since 1994. He is the author of Discovering Girard, 2004, Girard and Theology, 2009, as well as the co-editor with Sheila Hidden of Mimesis and Atonement, 2017, and with Ahmad Akhtar, Mimetic Theory and Islam, The Wound Where Light Enters, 2019. If you would all please join me in welcoming. Uh, thank you, Micah. Um, there's the joke about the parachutist who takes a leap out of a plane and all is going well until after 10 seconds when he pulls the ripcord and nothing happens. So he pulls the ripcord off his spare parachute and again, nothing happens. So this poor man is now hurtling towards certain death. And he looks down below him, and he sees, to his surprise, another man shooting up towards him. And as they go past one another, he shouts out, excuse me, do you know anything about parachutes? And the other man shouts back, no, do you know anything about gas boilers? I think it's a little uh, joke I like to introduce at any kind of um, interdisciplinary gathering where we can be a little bit like uh, people shooting past one another, exchanging scraps of information about our respective disciplines. And uh, I hope that this will be a fruitful encounter, perhaps even one that might uh, enable each of us on our respective journeys. And it's in that spirit that I'd like to thank Philip and the organizers of the conference for putting this together, this very I think, hermeneutically very generous conference to try and make connections to widen the horizons. That is always a good thing to be doing. And I think the project that's been outlined for us and this particular aspect of that is a very exciting one. So thank you for inviting me to be involved with it. And thank you in particular to Sean for uh, the work done in uh, making the, the thing uh, operate so smoothly. It's an excellent uh, conference so far. We are familiar with the phenomenon of the zealous convert, whose enthusiasm is greeted with humor and sometimes embarrassed nervousness. Jesus gives an extreme, though still not without humor, uh, an example in the vulnerability of a person newly delivered from demonic possession. This poor individual, in his cleansed state, finds himself prey to the original spirit as it returns with seven even more wicked companions to the newly swept out dwelling. This is Matthew 12. Less graphically, we can speak of the imbalance or distortion which can accompany any kind of spiritual breakthrough. And so far as René Girard spoke openly about the birth of mimetic theory in 1959 as a result of an intellectual and religious conversion, it seems fair to ask whether this illumination did not itself involve some degree of distorting enthusiasm. Girard, in fact, undertook several recalibrations of his theory. Most importantly, he renounced his earlier polemic against sacrifice as a Christian category, a polemic which he confesses was fueled by a desire to stress the distinctiveness of his freshly acquired mimetic insight. Another example is Girard's rolling back on what, following Nietzsche, he understood to be an absolute incompatibility between Dionysus and the crucified. Something that he, a distinction which he softens in his final book, Battling to the End. These examples are cited with a view to asking whether a similar recalibration is called for concerning Girard's critique of romanticism and deceit, desire, and the novel. While trying to conceive of what such an adjustment might look like, I would bring Girard into conversation with contemporary philosophical approaches to ancient questions concerning desire and religious experience. I should point out at this point that uh, 
the paper's kind of fallen in between two stools as I was a little bit undecided as to what direction it should go in. And I wanted specifically to um, mention uh, Roger Scruton as one philosopher who's been interested in working on, on Girard's ideas, uh, engaged with Girard's work over several decades, and a former colleague of mine at Heathrop College, Fiona Ellis, now at the University of Roehampton, has been attempting to broaden the parameters of philosophy of religion beyond the constraints of Kant and Nietzsche. Ellis's assertion that there is an epistemic quality to desire is significant as we seek to reassess Girard's dismissal of romanticism as pure mendacity. So in fact, I won't be going so much into them because the other side of which I wanted to kind of look at was to try and explore a little bit further some of my work on William Blake, whom I've looked at previously. And in the second part of the presentation, I'll be turning to Blake as a kind of um, analogy, analogous figure to Girard's engagement with Hölderlin. And uh, as I say, which way the final version of this paper might go uh, will depend on the kind of feedback I get as to which of these directions might be more interesting to look at. Uh, but this is, in that sense, definitely a workshop paper. Desire to see it in the novel is Girard's first elaboration of the cluster of insights which would come to be known as mimetic theory. The, epistem the epistemological structure of the theory is conveyed in the original French title, Mensonge Romantique et Verité Romanesque, though not so clearly in the English translation. The structure rests upon a distinction between two types of literature, which he des designates romantic and novelistic. The distinction consists, on the one hand, the literary texts which merely depict the mimetic process, from volatile mimetic desire to the scapegoating resolution, and on the other hand, texts which demonstrate some degree of insight into this mendacious process and point to a way of escaping from it. So the first group's false consciousness is more than a careless or casual mistake. The deception is not accidental, it is serious, pervasive and deliberate. Neither is the lie harmless or innocent. In the case of the comic figure of Don Quixote, the knight's, the knight's self-immersion in romantic fantasy is not ultimately destructive. But in other cases, the consequences of this individual and collective misunderstanding are deadly. The willful blindness to the origin of our appetites outside of ourselves, that is, uh, in, located in the model whom we are unconsciously imitating, is denounced by Girard as the romantic lie, founded on romanticism's valorization of the autonomous subject, whose sole artistic and ethical imperative is self-actualization through the unhindered realization of his or her desires. Such a description is, of course, anathema to contemporary critical approaches which eschew binary thinking. The question to be asked, therefore, is whether this stark division between romantic mendacity and novelistic truth is essential to mimetic theory, or whether it is one more fruit of the convert's zealous concern to protect the purity and distinctiveness of his freshly discovered faith. This question will be explored in the next section when I look at several, uh, well, uh, several possibilities for widening the horizon in this particular case. I'll then examine several Girardian retractions in the spirit of Augustine's retractions, with a view to establishing some kind of rapprochement between mimetic theory and romanticism, and sketch a recalibration by means of contemporary philosophical engagements with the nature of religious desire and experience. Drawing on Scruton and Ellis, I hope to suggest that romanticism need not be simply denounced as mendacious but may in fact complement and refine the mimetic insight. So what is the romantic lie, part two? Girard identifies five European writers who with, with, with Cervantes, Stendhal, Flaubert, Dostoevsky and Proust with mention of Balzac in the concluding chapter, whose work is qualitatively different from most other literature in its capacity to shed light on the phenomenon of mimetic desire. They manifest novelistic truth. By contrast, romantic writers fail to do so on account of their adherence to a false conception of the self, whose desires are autonomous and unique and not, as mimetic theory would have it, mediated by another. 
This anthropological mistake, according to Girard, is exposed primarily by biblical revelation and analogically by great literature. In fact, the scriptural origin of the mimetic insight is reflected in the fact that the chosen novelists resort to images of extravagant or distorted religious transcendence, veneration, idolatry, though they are not all committed believers. The novelistic capacity for revelation is not confined to one literary genre, as Girard later includes Shakespeare among the great writers gifted with mimetic insight. The romantic state of false consciousness is labelled méconnaissance, which is variously translated as misrecognition, miscognition, or misreading, or even misknowing. Sounds oxymoronic or euphemistic, like one speaks of misspeaking, or I misspoke, or that was a misstep. As asserted above, this is not a causal, a casual, or innocent mistake. Méconnaissance represents the relationship between desire and knowledge, and so far as our relationship to the truth is determined by the extent to which we want something to be true. This is a well-recognized aspect of extreme ideological beliefs. The more a person gains true knowledge about the state of affairs, the misrecognition paradoxically increases. Reconnaissance refers not only to the denial of the unstable and volatile nature of desire, but also to the process by which the consequent interpersonal and social tensions are resolved. A temporary and ersatz social order is established by the discharge of violence upon a victim or group of victims. People or groups within the throes of mimetic desire wrongly identify people or things as the cause of their problems. So in each of these two phases, mimetic desire escalating to a crisis and the resolution of the crisis by means of victimization, the phenomenon of méconnaissance comes into play. With regard to the second phase, the scapegoating mechanism, miscognition consists in two catastrophic errors. The wrongful imputation of guilt on an innocent party and the equally mistaken belief that the cathartic peace which descends on the group after its action is somehow connected and even attributable to the victim. This construction of a false sacred is the result of reconnaissance. So it's just pointing out that reconnaissance works on a number of levels or a number of points in the cycle. So the, the version of reconnaissance that's treated in Desire to See to the Novel, which is the, the mistaken view about our desires and where they come from, is related to the, vari the other variations on reconnaissance which are involved in the kind of scapegoating resolution. As an aside, there's an interesting discussion, or important discussion to be had here about um, the, 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 the structure of this argument, which in many respects in the world of fake news and, and alternative realities and alternative facts, seems very, very quaint. You know, the, the argument is very straightforward. It's a journey from illusion to truth, akin to the laborious struggle out of Plato's cave towards the sun. And Girard uses the term conversion with its religious connotations. But what does this mean in a context where not only people are, are not only given up on the question, what is truth, but the idea that truth actually doesn't matter or is not as important perhaps as we philosophers and theologians think it is. So there's a, there's a contextual cultural shift uh, which makes this discussion um, even more complex, it seems to me. And it's something we haven't talked about a great deal in this conference yes, yet, but might, might come up later on. So the broad outlines of the nascent mimetic theory are set out in the opening chapter of Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, a chapter entitled Triangular Desire. And it unfolds an analysis of texts from Cervantes and Stendhal and then the other authors. It includes discussion of Scherer on resentment, as the uh, resentment as the reality which blocks us off from recognizing mimetic desire. The terms romantic and Romanesque are defined and opposed. Romantic works reflect but do not reveal the presence of a mediator. Novelistic works reveal this presence. And you can see with this quotation from Joao that the battle lines have been drawn. The objective and subjective fallacies are one and the same. 
both originate in the image which we all have of our own desires, subjectivisms and objectivisms, romanticisms and realisms, individualisms and scientisms, idealisms and positivisms appear to be in opposition, but are secretly in agreement to conceal the presence of the mediator. All these dogmas are the aesthetic of philosophical translation of worldviews peculiar to internal mediation. They all depend directly or indirectly on the lie of spontaneous desire. They all defend the same illusion of autonomy to which modern man is passionately devoted. Romantic critics on the receiving end of this uh, um, judgment, they are variously described as hostile, blind, proud, Promethean, willful denial of the sublime lucidity of the novel, romantic criticism rejects what is essential, quote. In the concluding chapter, Girard makes explicit the religious, specifically Christian, contours of the novelistic conversion experience. Christian symbolism is universal, for it alone is able to give form to the experience of the novel. Religious themes are present, even when clothed in negations. The Johannine version about the grain of wheat which must fall and die becomes almost a leitmotif in Girard's canon of novelists. An association here with the novelistic anti-romantic imagination uh, with religious faith is reminiscent to me of T.E. Hume's famous description of romanticism as spilt religion, which derives from a polemical opposition very similar to Girard's. And I don't know whether Girard knew this, this essay, I'm going to dwell on that just for a moment. Hume offers a critique of the, what he calls the romantic position. He sets up romanticism versus classicism. The critique of the romantic position which understands humanity as an infinite reservoir of possibilities for self-fulfillment. He seeks instead to rehabilitate the classical view which holds the human person to be an extraordinary fix, so quote, an extraordinary fixed and limited animal whose nature is absolutely constant. It is only by tradition and organisation that anything decent can be got out of him. And this is the choice that Hume uh, puts up uh, to be made between two views of humanity. One by which the person is intrinsically good, spoilt only by circumstance. The other that he is intrinsically limited, but disciplined by order and tradition to something fairly decent. Um, and... Again, Christianity is associated with one worldview rather than the other. It's associated with the, the classical worldview. Insofar as the rejection of Pelagianism and the embrace of original sin places it within the category of the classical. Suppression of this in the name of limitless human potential will have disastrous effects. You don't believe in a God, so you begin to believe that man is a God. You don't believe in heaven, so you begin to believe in a heaven on earth. In other words, you get romanticism. The concepts that are right and proper in their own sphere are spread over and so mess up, falsify and blur the clear outlines of human experience. It's like pouring a pot of treacle over the dinner table. Romanticism then, and this is the best description I can give of it, is spilt religion. The tantalizing affinities between uh, Girard and Hume not least when Hume says that the amount of freedom in man is much exaggerated and that many acts which we habitually label free are in reality automatic. He expresses contempt for romanticism's gesture towards a vague religious transcendence, whereas in the classic it is always the light of ordinary day, never the light that never was on land and sea. It is always perfectly human and never exaggerated. A phrase that resonates for Girardin scholars, man is always man and never a god. Hume presses home the falsity and exhaustion of the romantic ideal, though not its violence. The disastrous effects, which Girard considers, of men becoming gods in the eyes of each other. Hume's rejection of romanticism is as emphatic as Girard's, though the essay Romanticism and Classicism contains humour and nuance, which is largely absent from desire to see it in the novel. So you have on the left the, the classical uh, depiction of the romantic uh, individual um, faced with a, a kind of uh, vaporous uh, um, 
reality of, of you know, the um, expansive sublime etc I suppose what I want to draw attention to is that the picture on the right uh, which is a much more clearly defined depiction of human beings as they stand before God one might equally want to challenge because it, it reinforces this idea of uh, an individual unmediated experience of God uh, I know that Adam is meant to represent humanity the human race but the one might want to say that there are two variations of the same uh, difficulty here, uh, although in each case the reality which the individual, the autonomous individual is being related to uh, is, um, is in one case religious and the other it is much more vaguely presented. Uh, where this is going, when where Blake, when Blake later on uh, presents a much more crowded version of the originary scene. So, uh, Blake's depiction of the other account in Genesis of the creation of Adam and Eve together, uh, at least the, um, uh, is, so the creation of Adam and Eve, well, this is the same account of Adam and Eve being brought uh, into uh, introduction there by, by God, uh, but the, the, already the relationality is stressed in that picture, and the instability of that relationality is depicted in the portrayal of Adam and Eve, a beautiful couple, loved up couple. Um, I should also add, those of you who know Blake's work, um, <laughs> the faces are a self portrait of Blake and his wife, Catherine. I don't think, uh, in terms of their, their physique, they looked anything like that. Um, but uh, you get the picture. Here's a beautiful, loved up couple, uh, as, as delicious as anything you'd see out of Hollywood. And yet the instability of Eve looking at Satan who's pointing to the fruit. So the originary scene is already highly problematized in Blake. And this is a, his paintings based on Milton. Uh, and from the beginning, you see the, the, the interpersonal, the inter-individual um, dimension. And you also see the instability that goes with that. So we return then to the image offered at the opening of this presentation about the zeal of the neophyte. Um, in the, her biography of, of Girard, Cynthia Haven cites Richard Maxey, his comment that Girard goes around baptizing everyone he likes, like as converts tend to do. And this is, this is the converse too, that in the name of his newly found orthodoxy, is it Girard at times renouncing his past a little bit too fervently. Do we need, therefore, to revisit and recalibrate the strident distinction between novelistic truth and romantic mendacity? So what I say a little bit more about now is what I'm calling retractions, not in the sense of um, renouncing a position, but in the sense of Augustine's retractions, which were written over in, in the end of his life, which comprised a retrospective rereading and review of all his written works, one at a time, in a process of clarifying and correcting for the sake of his readers. Now, Girard doesn't do anything as comprehensive as that, but there are moments in his career, clearly, where there are uh, particular recalibrations coming out of his in, uh, concern to establish as clearly as possible the distinctive contours of his insight which, by Girard's own admission, has at times led to unbalanced or misleading formulations. And ironically, the distorted presentation has caused the exact opposite effect of what mimetic theory advocates, as when Girard admits to scapegoating the letter to the Hebrews and sacrifice more generally, which we'll examine shortly. This concern is evangelical in the literal sense, as it involves a renewed embrace of Christianity, but the term in its looser and slightly pejorative metaphorical sense also applies. So the subsequent readjustments may be considered reconsiderations or clarifications in the spirit of Augustine's retractionis. And the purpose of drawing attention to these is to prepare the way for a possible similar reconsideration of the anti-romantic polemic, which is such a strong feature of desire, deceit and the novel. 
And the most prominent of these retractions was his acceptance of sacrifice as a legitimate concept in Christian life and faith, despite his vehement rejection of it in things hidden since the foundation of the world. Largely as a result of his collaboration with Raymond Schwager, Girard came to acknowledge that the antipathy which had led him to scapegoat the letter to the Hebrews was mistaken and unnecessary. It was based, he admitted, on a concern to ensure the purity of his mimetic insight. And this is um, in the course of a conference at uh, Innsbruck, I think in one of the, the Festschrift uh, events for Raymond and Schwager, when Girard admitted that he'd kind of overdone it a little bit with respect to sacrifice. I believe the overriding significance of the mimetic theory had to be in directing all apologetic efforts against religious relativism, as to expose its weaknesses. I was afraid that traditional definition of the passion in terms of the concept of sacrifice would supply so many additional arguments for assimilating Christianity to the category of archaic religion. For this reason, I have a long time considered this usage to be degenerate. Important therefore to notice that Girard con concedes a semantic point about the term sacrifice. In the end, it's a rec recognition that a term may take on different meanings. And the suggestion is that this might be where a similar retraction might take place if we re rehabilitate the concept of the term uh, uh, romanticism. Can there be a re rehabilitation which leaves the main structure of Girard's tower intact? Uh, we've seen that for Girard and for T. Hume, whom we also cited, the issue is related very directly to the question of religious belief and its relation to desire. I then therefore turn to two philosophers who I think would help me along, certainly, and whether people have come across them, uh, I don't know whether any comments might be forthcoming. Uh, Fiona Ellis investigates desire's connection with the quest for God, specifically the alleged choice between two mutually, seemingly exclusive conceptions of desire, desire as lack or desire as plenitude, creativity. Current Nietzschean-inspired philosophical orthodoxy insists that we contemptuously reject the deficit model as unworthy of human beings, of interest only to priests. She cites Deleuze's dismissal of the long column of crooners of castration. Ellis engages with Sartre and Nietzsche, but also with Emmanuel Levinas, to demonstrate that a simple alignment of the deficit model of desire with religious belief and the plenitude version of desire with atheism, as implied by Deleuze, is not convincing. This is because Sartre, no priest, works with a version of desire as a kind of lack, albeit with a Nietzschean sensibility. And because Levinas, on the other hand, rejects the lack model in the name of theism. So what you're trying to do is break down uh, the kind of link between religious belief and one version of this equation and um, in search with desire as lack and the, uh, the plenitude model which gets taken up by romanticism. In other words, Ellis wishes to challenge the notion that religion is the enemy of desire and therefore of life. And she looks for a less ideologically fraught description of the problem of desire. There's no space here to expand on this proposal. It should be clear that her attempt to reformulate the problem of desire in a way that is intellectually generous towards both theistic and atheistic concerns can serve as a template for any possible refinement of Girard's arguments in Desire, Deceit and the novel. Um, the more expansive space which Ellis calls for requires a pushback on the restraints of both Kant and Nietzsche. The supposed truth of atheism has not been established and is certainly not established by anything said by Nietzsche, Sartre or the latter-day disciples. She advocates a direct realism which, in a theistic context, grants us to write the, say, the right to say that desire can be God-involving and that God's presence can be seen as a form of absence. Philosophy, in such a key, therefore, is able to reconnect with what the Christian mystical tradition has persistently affirmed about the epistemic nature of desire. The other thinker allied, for, in my mind, with, with uh, Ellis's work is Roger Scruton, who similarly tries to bridge traditions of thought 
claiming a multiple of intellectual identities. He claims himself to be a French intellectual and a German romantic, as well as an English pragmatist. Scruton considers piety and belief in God to be rational, but not amenable to reason, and therefore requires a turn to art and myth for clarification. On, on this account, Girard's account of the common structure of myth has a particular appeal, though he does have his own philosophical reservations. We may note, interestingly, a similar kind of conversion experience on uh, Scruton's account, uh, Scruton's own life, similar to Girard, and also a mutual antipathy towards other French intellectual philosophical luminaries who are, for Scruton, doing the devil's work of de de desecration, of desecration. Spiritual's, Scruton's spiritual journey mirrors that of Girard, and so far as he moves from being a voyeur of holiness towards authentic Christian commitment. So two thinkers there that I think might move this uh, question forward. The final section is called a scriptural and poetic coda. And it's a kind of uh, bring in uh, uh, Blake a little bit as a kind of uh, enrichment of our discussion of Girard and Helderlin, because I think Blake is very uh, similar in many respects and uh, an interesting figure to, to look at. Uh, but before we do that, here's a little scripture quote which I've always found very helpful. It's from the book of Nehemiah, and it's about the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, the, the, uh, the exiles have been restored from uh, exile from, uh, from Babylon, and here they are trying to reconstruct under very dangerous conditions. From that day forward, half the men under me were engaged in the actual building, while the other half stood by, holding their spears, shields, and bows, and wearing coats of mail. And officers supervised all the people of, Judea, of Judah who were engaged on the wall. The porters carrying the loads held their load with one hand and a weapon with the other. The builders had their swords attached to their belts as they built. Neither I nor my kinsmen nor the men under me nor my bodyguard ever took off our clothes. Each one kept his right hand on his spear. Fiona Ellis describes herself as an active bridge builder between analytic and analytical and continental approaches to the philosophy of religion. Roger Scruton, similarly, is a skeptical Francophile who seeks to bring together the continental and Anglo-Saxon philosophical worlds, literary panache and common sense. The Girard of deceit, desire in the novel is not building, how am I doing? Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll wind up. Uh, I'm just getting excited. <laughs> no, no, we'll, 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 end, we'll end up. The Girard of Deceit design in the novel is not building bridges, but a fortification, with a primary concern for its foundations and robustness. The Girard is fully aware of the lines of attack and of the presence of foes. Even as he builds, he keeps his right hand on his spear. The argument of this paper is that the mature reception of Girard's theory consists in a shift according to these archaeological, architectural, according to these architectural metaphors, and that its continued success derives from a readiness to acknowledge connections and affinities which it had previously ignored or denied. In other words, to build bridges as well as shore up fortifications. It is in the spirit of Ellis and Scruton's openness to the continental as well as English influences that I offer or would offer by way of a coda, a comparison of two poets, Friedrich Hölderlin and William Blake, associated with Romanticism, but offering very different perspectives from their respective German and English backgrounds. So just as the chapter on Romanticism in Gerard's last book, a uh, chapter on Hölderlin, represents something of a kind of rapprochement with the struggles of the Romantic poet, so I suggest that Blake, a fortiori, is even more interesting to look at Blake, more firmly rooted in the Christian tradition, by no means an orthodox thinker, uh, but someone who we certainly can turn to as an example of a romantic liar. Uh, and when I first gave a paper on Girard at a conference, one of our esteemed colleagues said, Blake is just another romantic liar. Uh, and I would say, well, actually, there's much more going on in Blake than that. There is a fascination with um, 
uh, with uh, Christ, which is similar to that held up by uh, Helderlin, allegedly by Girard, the baptized Helderlin. The thunder has provided in another way, for Christ gives himself up. Hercules is like the princes, Bacchus is the spirit of the community, but Christ is the end. The presence which the heavenly beings lack, which they cannot give to others, Christ gives. And my argument using Blake is that the, um, the difficulties of the um, original scenario are there from the beginning. You have this, uh, the entanglements of mimetic desire are vividly presented to us. It's uh, outcome, the fruit of that in terms of human violence and the kind of depiction of Cain and Abel. And two paintings by Blake, written at the turn of the 19th century, around 1804. The one on the left is called The Blasphemer, the symmetry of the uh, execution of the stoning. Uh, set over against the uh, disruption of that by Christ. For whatever reason, in those years, Blake was obsessed with Christ as the source of forgiveness. And what is it that this romantic liar was trying to be forgiven for? What is it that he felt required uh, the mercy of God and saw Christ as central to that? I've tried already in one paper to try and offer a kind of uh, Girardian reading of Blake uh, and that's a work I want to try and continue. And it seems to me that something of the kind of rapprochement and the connections that are um, valid for the later Girard could well apply to that particular study. So we'll finish off there and see what we make of it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Curran. And now we will have a response by Sean Palmer. Uh, thank you, Pro uh, Professor Kerwin, uh, for your insightful presentation. I very much enjoyed your reflection on reconnaissance, and reconnaissance is really such an important concept, I think, in the reading of Girard, because it's such a catch-all uh, regarding the relationship between desire and what you talked about in his the epistemic nature of desire, and it's, it's present in his literary criticism and it's also in it, present in his interpretation of cultures and anthropology. So I would like to focus on three points stemming from your talk, which I'll attempt to bring together to address the, your primary concern, which is how do we view Girard's first work, Deceit, Desire, and the Novel? And is he unfairly scapegoating what he understands as romanticism and the romantic lie? The first point is how to understand the romantic lie and what seems to be the broader implication for Girard's intention. The second point leads to the question of textual interpretive violence and is it possibly justified? And finally, the broadest connection of how to interpret conversion as an internal hermeneutic methodolo methodology to Girard's corpus. I believe it is important to not treat romanticism like other scapegoated isms, which you brought up in your paper, and one of, uh, an example being scholasticism. That is ignoring the nuance of thinkers who may or may not fit under the label of the accepted narrative. The issue with this process of isming is not just that there are usually mislabeled thinkers, but the original trends of critique from where the narrative of the ism emerges should also not be minimized. With this clarification, I agree that Kerwin has demonstrated, especially with the artwork of William Blake, and this was a line from your conclusion, uh, as William Blake's struggle for mimetic truth, while also being internal to the ism of romanticism. That being said, if what we mean by romanticism in Girard's critique is the illusion of spontaneous desire leading to a solipsistic and prideful existence, that not only alienates the other, but the self, and the possibility of vertical trans transcendence, then by definition, by indicating Blake's potential mimetic insights and a definite openness to some level of the sacred, he would not be complicit in the perpetuation of the romantic illusion. He would be on the way of conversion, 
and in fact contribute to its internal structural critique. Yet, is Girard justified in his usage of, of, the, of the strident tone of deceit, desire in the novel, which Curran identifies? And does there seem to be a level of textual aggression or possible violence to this romantic illusion? Why does Girard, a thinker who advocates that the divinity of Christ is indicated by a supreme rejection of nonviolence, is seemingly scapegoating the romantic lie, or even the self? <clears throat> To, continues, to continue Kerman's analogy uh, from the uh, quote from Nehemiah of the early Girard is building his city with a spear in his hand, is the corpse of the romantic lie hidden at the foundation of his own system? To explain this possible contradiction in the early Girard, let's first ask the question, is the romantic lie an innocent textual scapegoat? In William Desmond's Art, Origins, and Otherness, we catch sight of a similar concern to Girard regarding the romantic lie. We begin by asserting our creative superiority, he quotes, and, and wondering if we are playthings of something outside of our control. We stand above nature and end up as enigmatic productions thrown into being by nature out of, out of our control, now more enigmatic than ever before, and even filling us with unease about something more sinister underground, end quote. Girard and Desmond's critique of the implications of the romantic lie is not to destroy the self or its creativity, but to reveal either the mimetic or porosity to otherness can only serve one master, and this master informs the self's composition. These two masters, or true sub two subjects of two opposed logoi, are the deviated transcendency of the satanic system of bad mimesis, or the Christocentric creative mimesis. If the romantic lie is allowed to, to close off this receptivity, the self's pretension to complete autonomy leads to the underground of desire, as we've talked about with Dostoevsky's underground man. So if Girard then feels uh, justified to commit textual violence to the romantic lie because of its implications, isn't it still a contradiction considering his emphasis on nonviolence and Christic imitation of non-rivalrous behavior in his later works? This is where the Girardian identification with his postmodern textual theorists begins to break down. Girard is a firm believer in a reality outside the text, and that there exist real innocent victims behind myths and cultural institutions. In the scapegoat, he says, his, uh, uh, in the scapegoat, he's, oh, I'll skip that part. His polemical and strident tone, especially deceit, desire, in the novel, which is prior to his anthropological turn, does not completely disappear in his later works. There are very few, if any, interpretive sacred taboos that he holds, as long as in the diversity of phenomena explained by mimetic theory, he also reveals the romantic lie, or more general terms, as Kerwin identified, the dispelling of reconnaissance. To fully explicate this hermeneutic approach of revealing facts and, preve and preventing his method from appearing like an unsystematic or arbitrary justification of his insight, we must subject his own corpus to his own internal structural analysis, which is a, a hermeneutics of conversion. Since these novelists are thinkers of conversion, and it, only, and it is only via the unity of their seemingly apocalyptic conclusions revealing the mimetic insight that their early works are able to be reconciled in a progression of understanding. This logic of internal revelation via conversion is best characterized by Girard's reading of Judaism and Christianity. The earliest works in the scriptures still reveal the struggle for the mimetic insight while steeped in the primitive sacred and the sacrificial. Just because we are an age following the cross, we do not exclude them, but they are able to affirm this progressive understanding. Dostoevsky's early works are steeped in the Romantic lie as well. And then Girard supporting by the biographical reading of Dostoevsky's life, the, fa the foundation of novelistic truth is still there. Girard's corpus follows this similar path of what Paul Ricoeur also terms as a progressive th synthesis, where the truth of each stage is only revealed retrospectively from a further stage. The earlier stages are not repudiated, but illuminated by the unity of the conclusions. The tone of deceit desire in the novel does not fully seem compatible with Sherard's corpus until the Christocentrism of I see Satan fall like lightning or the urgency of battling to the end. Sherard's struggle for the mimetic insight is very much there in his first work, while he also seems to be within his own primitive sacred or cloud of reconnaissance. Moreover, when Girard critiques the primitive sacred, he says that these rites were wrong at their time, but they were necessary to combat a greater evil, 
which is the possibility of unchecked violence. We just happen to live in an age where the tools or tool of dispelling reconnaissance have now been incarnated. Dispelling of reconnaissance produced via the romantic lie is more important in Girard's early work than his tone of the possible collateral damage to the sensibilities of a creative self. Each of Girard's later works become more systematic, less opaque, less opaque and equivocal, yet without repudiating or amending his sacrificial origin. Because he believes we are justified in doing violence to the text to expose real violence, and the romantic illusion is the dangerous perpetuator to a worse self-violence, it, it is satanic in the Girardian sense, and it's an obstacle to establishing a real means for conversion. One is reminded of Christ preaching in Matthew 5, verse 30. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. This represents a biblical precedent for the justified self-violence to scandalons via a scandalous claim. These stumbling blocks perpetuate untruth regarding man's medic receptivity and his possibility for a Christocentric mediation. But the dispelling of reconnaissance to not be complicit with the sense of external scapegoating violence must be dispelled via the progressive structural conversion from within. Thank you. Uh, is this on? You can come. Sean's terrific. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you, well, you clearly engaged both with my own paper and with the Girardian scholarship extremely fruitfully and I think very accurately as far as I can see. So that's, that's, that's very, very helpful. And, and I think you put I think very, a little bit more clearly the kind of position that I was moving towards. So uh, uh, that's, that's very helpful. I think and I was, I'm trying to keep a little bit of powder dry for responding to John a bit later on. Uh, but the point I was going to bring up in that later presentation is this this kind of the romantic line, mechanisance, which you picked up on as, as a as um as a catch all theme. And I wonder whether an image that could be useful for us here is the, the notion of well, teaching, pedagogy, um, or many of us if we're teachers, we encounter the romantic lie every day when you've got a group of undergraduates in front of you. And apologies to any undergraduates who are here, but you're, you have that, um, you're, you're, you're dealing with reconnaissance, whether it's ignorance, uh, it's, it's a kind of systematic ignorance which has a certain structure to it. And the task of education, it seems to me, is, is gradually dismantling that, uh, of saying, well, actually, you know, the world isn't as you think it is. It's a bit more complicated, uh, and uh, the factors are a bit more complex. But as long as there is a readiness on the part of the student to listen to that and move with that, no harm is done. That's what education is about. And I think it's, it's the persistence of a worldview um, that, that is obviously the worrying aspect of that. And where I was going to pick up with this, John, the, when Kant talks about daring to know, think for yourself, that's what we do with our students, and that's what is so important. But the association of um, a refusal to do that with an arrested development, which is what it is for Kant, this is, this is what tutelage consists in, um, is something that uh, I think is problematic, certainly for religious uh, belief, because belief then becomes associated with a state of dependence, a state of tutelage. So that's the kind of particular break that needs to be made. But I suppose my point is you know, there's nothing wrong with that particular example of romantic uh, um, deceit or self-deceit within a particular context where it is seen as part of a developmental process away from that. Uh, and in a sense, there's no harm done, except when people insist on being stuck in that adolescent phase. And one might say that that's one possible description of the of the romantic ideal, that the artist uh, has no responsibilities, is basically uh, a kind of immaturity that, that sets in there, and that does seem to me to be need, need to be dismantling. But I don't know if that's another possible way of looking at this. Um, uh, that, uh, yeah. Um, I would agree, especially yeah. when you talked about, it's, like, it's almost a necessary part of development, 
Yeah. Like you talk about the adolescent. It's just, I guess, where the reconnaissance becomes an obstacle is that, especially in my own teaching experience, right? It's, it's the persistence. It's the willful persistence. It's where the pride, I guess, emerges. But it's almost, it be, almost becomes, you can interpret it as necessary <coughs> to the process of development is that sacrifice of pride or, or the, you know, it's Yeah, like, uh, no, it's, it's, it's wonderful to know everything as one does at the age of 17 and, and uh, realize that actually things are not quite so simple. Um, uh, that's that's a, a fun process for all involved. Uh, that just reminds me of a, a joke following on from the uh, reference yesterday to the, uh, the teenager saying, hey, look, I didn't want to be born. Um, I'm a great fan of the Canadian cartoonist Gary Larson. Uh, and he has a cartoon called uh, the Cartoon Teenager. He says, hey, I didn't ask to be drawn. <laughs> that's no more jokes today, don't worry. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, but that's, 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 that's very, very helpful. And, and the overall, I won't go into detail on what I said there, but that just strikes me as, as, as very much um, complementary to what I'm doing. So thank you. Okay, we will now open the floor for questions. If you would, just please sack up, up to the microphone per usual. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting and full of thoughts. Uh, just a, one question first. The, the presentation of the Romantic is very decontextualized. And I'm just, again, not uh, mounting a full-scale defense of Romanticism, but certainly a partial... If you place Romanticism by reference to the world picture we find in let's say, the, coming from the 16th century right into the 18th century, right into our own time, you have this desacralized universe. You have this mechanistic totality, which is a kind of dead dareness following laws. Uh, uh, the world has lost any sense of an intimacy with God. Uh, you may try to compensate for that by some deistic transcendence, but you're simply continuing the lack of intimacy between the divine and the creation. So you could at least mount a partial defense of the romantic reaction to that as trying to seek out uh, that sense of a more intimate imminence. Uh, again, it has tremendous uh, dangers built into it, but the impulse itself is not by any means to be... Um, put aside, and I, I don't know, uh, you, 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 this is a question for elaboration, if Girard makes any efforts to try and contextualize romanticism in that sense. I think it makes a big difference, really, because then if uh, romanticism is spilt religion, it's still religion, mm -hmm. and the fact that one can take that too much for granted, that there is some given religious orientation that is there to be fall, fallen back on. But I do think that some of the great romantics felt that the world had been uh, robbed of a deeply necessary intimate communication with some divine principle. It's not incidental that Spinoza suddenly becomes the god for trunk and a man at the end of the 18th century, whereas previously he was the scandalous atheist. You know, Spinoza maledictus becomes Spinoza benedictus in the eyes of the Romantics. And again, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, agreeing with what Romanticism does in its totality, but the, the impulse itself is well worth. And I think that's the continuing, um, you find it in Emerson and Thoreau and Walt Whitman, just to take up some points from yesterday also. But that would be a first point. But the second point would be just asking about the contrast between desire as lack and plenitude and not getting into the swamp of French theory. Deleuze is an, claims to be an inheritor of Nietzsche over against Hegel, so there's a, there's a whole agenda there in relation to desire as negation and so on. But I, I'll switch back to my divine Plato once again. If you go back to the symposium, and this is in my own paper in the, the version I dropped into the Dropbox, the parentage of Eros is not just Penea. Eros is a lack, but its parentage is in Poros and Penea. And Poros, and the story as it goes, is there was a feast of the gods, um, and in the celebration they were drinking divine nectar. Poros gets drunk, 
stumbles from the table, falls asleep on the ground, and somehow Penia managed to copulate with Penia, and out of the conjunction, the Sunusia, Eros is born. Now, my point is this, poros, whether it is connected with porosity or not, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an origin in divine festivity also in the erotics. So you here have a kind of twinning, an, an erotic sunusia, being with of the, of the plenty and the lacking. So there's, there, there's room for deep sophistication of reflection on the nature of desire, not just simply as plenitude and not just simply as lack. And I fear that just simply setting one over against the other doesn't, doesn't uh, do justice really to what's at stake in human desire. And again, it's a question too for Gerard, to what extent the, the issue was brought up yesterday. He was, uh, at least in the early stages, under the influence of Sartre's interpretation of desire is lack, which again is an inheritance from Hegelian negativity and uh, Kojevian reading of Hegel that entered into the very texture of French intellectual life over decades. So those two points, the decontextualization and plenitude and lack. Uh, but start with the decontextualization. Does, does Gerard give us that place where romanticism could be looked at somewhat differently? And two excellent suggestions. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, that, that's very helpful. I agree entirely. I think um, it's a, and maybe it's it's the, the the kind of continued adolescence in me that wants to to see something still in in romanticism and its affirmation that I don't want to let go. And um, uh, I think your possible defence of it, or at least partial defence, is is exactly right. But that's what I had in mind. Um, with trying to kind of uh, defend against uh, uh, Girard's case and doing that in a more contextual way would certainly be very, very helpful. And um, it, it does relate then to, to the, the whole question of design. As, as you say, there's a great swamp there, I'm uh, not in a position to get into. And um, I suppose. The point I wanted to get to, at least referring to, as at least start with base one, that you know, um, the distinction between lack and plenitude may itself be unhelpful. What is also unhelpful is putting religion and religious belief on one side of that, and, uh, and the priests as the, the the crooners of castration. Now, Blake could have come up with a, a phrase like that, and there's a, there's a selection of quotations from the Proverbs of Hell, from the Marriage of Heaven and Hell, which I didn't uh, quote there. Uh, which are you know, classic about the, the, the priests going around cursing our desires and, and the men in black robes, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> That's very much a part of what Blake's doing. And I think he too wrestled with that problem of, uh, of, of um, lack and plenitude, probably because, as you say, it's a false dichotomy. Uh, so I think that the two themes kind of come together there, and I think they come together contextually in, let's, let's say, uh, Ireland at the moment, where you know religion has a particular um, profile, uh, which is an unhelpful one, and uh, uh, if we can begin to dismantle some of the misconceptions or uh, dead ends that are associated with that, that would be absolutely terrific, and uh, that's something that might uh, come up in the discussion. Uh, but yeah, see, I keep going back to Blake, um, who's very much a singular figure. I mean, he doesn't fit into. Uh, any tradition very straightforwardly, and I think that's part of what we're trying to do, is recognizing that there are no, um, well, no isms <laughs> that, that will do the job for us. Does, does Girard engage with romanticism? I guess the nearest would be, would be the chapter on Hilden. Um, uh, I can't think of anywhere else where he turns, turns to that. Um, but uh, certainly your first point about um, a, a fuller exposition of romanticism, what it is and, and, and why it's there, uh, would certainly be useful for me. And then some stage to look more closely at that uh, design question. Very, very helpful. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Thanks a lot, Michael. This was very helpful. Um, I think... Um, you know, there's this problem of an intellectualist error, and any 
I think a lot of people who study mimetic theory, you, you sort of see the theory and then you, you kind of walk around life for a few weeks or months or years with this kind of thrill of, oh my gosh, I see there's this mimetic desire at work over there and there's scapegoating the department and, you know, <laughs> poor old Aunt Betty at Thanksgiving dinner and, you know, everybody's taking her down. And, uh, you know, uh, w w you, you see all these things everywhere, and, but except in yourself, right? And then when you finally do see it in yourself, it's like, you, you, you know, then you realize this intellectualist air of thinking that if you understood the theory, then you would somehow be free of it. And I think, you know, the, I don't know if it would be helpful to maybe distinguish between the critique of romanticism and romantics. And in a way, you know, the novelistic heroes of Deceit, Desire, and the Novel I'm sure in, in ways in their literature and, and, uh, or, or in their lives, you know, there's still this kind of pull of the romantic. And, and, um, and you know, Girard, he makes, one of the reasons I like Girard is I like polemical extremes. It's just something in me. And, uh, and so he never stops making what seem like polemically extreme, you know, over the top statements and battling to the end is probably his most pugnacious book. So he's not, he's not um, taken away from this style. But the interesting thing that he says in there is, is about the history of Christianity and realizing how much of that history is a failure. You know? And so it wasn't just that Christians got the insight into the scapegoat mechanism and then for 2,000 years just stopped scapegoating. I mean, the history of Christianity is a history of scapegoating, and it seems like maybe the healthy place for sort of a Girardian way of being to reside is in some kind of community that allows one to go through a sort of long therapeutic process of, you know, recognizing yourself as a sinner, being forgiven, having an opportunity to collectively ask for forgiveness. So I don't, I don't know if that, um, I, I would just be curious what you would think about any of that. Yeah, that, that's um, well, the question there of institutional Christianity and, and how that fits into this picture. And uh, well, I don't know, there's, there's lots there, it's, um, but uh, it's certainly an aid for a lot of believers to, to explain why is there so much nastiness in our church? Why are we not, and it's not just me individually, but collectively. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to also recognize that this is about us and not simply me. Um, why are we collectively such a failure? And to remind ourselves or to have a community that helps us to understand that, um, I think it's just very, very encouraging. And, and I, very use, I often use the passage of Jesus with his earliest disciples and they're arguing among themselves what, you know, who's the greatest. Now, though, they didn't talk like that before Jesus came. Um, you know, these are fishermen, peasants, etc. And here they are jostling for position in the heavenly ranks. And if you ask who causes that, who catalyzes that process, it's the presence of Jesus among them. Um, so to actually say, well, actually, this is what you expect. You know, you put people in the proximity of the sacred and it does weird things to them. It turns their heads. You know, this is dangerous stuff. There's nothing to be reminded of the dangerous aspects, this radioactive thing called the sacred and what that does to people and how we try and contain that and make that fruitful in some way is what we're trying to do. And we fail. And in the words of Beckett, the task is to fail better. And uh, so I think there is a... a a powerful tool there for, for self-understanding of the Christian community and what it's trying to do and recognizing um, yeah, that pattern of you know, self-acknowledgement, self-implication and moving on from that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's clearly very, very powerful. But also I suppose being wary of alternatives and say, so, okay, is there somewhere else where we can do that better? Is there somewhere else that succeeds politics? Economics? Is, is there any area of human life where 
there's just straightforward human flourishing as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to uh, you know failing better or failing worse um, so yeah okay that's the the time for our session if you would please help me join me in welcoming our speakers Thank you very much.